Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around for the final talk. Um, so today, I want to talk about site development and utilization in Japan and the UK. Um, as I was preparing this talk, I realized I have a lot of data, a lot of information about Japan, but actually very little about the UK. So in a sense, I want to introduce Japan as a way of maybe eliciting discussion to think about maybe differences and um, ways of comparing and thinking about um, these in a global perspective. Um, so. Primarily, in, when I look at s when I'm talking about site development and utilization, um, my interests have been specifically in this kind of activity: the reconstruction of uh, dwellings or uh, buildings. And precisely, I've been looking at um, these reconstructed buildings in Japan that are meant to represent archaeological findings anywhere from 10,000 years ago to as recent as about 1,300 years ago. Um, in Japan, these are very specifically um, sort of before literacy, so there's no uh, written recordings about these buildings. Um, in Japan, very specifically, all of these buildings are um, use organic materials solely. So there's, at mo in most cases, all you'll ever find are post holes, uh, pit drilling, the pit holes, um, if you're very lucky, you might find uh, charred carbon remains, um, or in just a few cases, uh, waterlogged remains. So there's very little information on which these are based to rebuild them. Um, so my research was looking at a few specific buildings in, or sites in Japan, and I was trying to write this paper a couple years ago. I actually gave a talk um, at TAG about this, and what I realized I couldn't do is I couldn't say anything general about these buildings. I could say very specific things about specific sites, but once I tried to say, well, this is how the sort of practice of reconstruction goes on in Japan, I couldn't say anything. So I decided to uh, do a database. And uh, sort of, this is my list of sites um, and some of the basic information about it. I have another list with all of the buildings. So. My first question, actually this is probably the only question for the audience, is in the UK, how many different sites would you estimate have these kind of prehistoric reconstructed buildings? Does anyone have a number that they might be able to even imagine? Just in East Anglia. Yeah, uh, no, like nationwide. Ten, 20, yeah, yeah, yeah my, my yeah, guess would be maybe 20. 20. I, I, did, I did a little look, I, I found about 20, maybe 30. In Japan, we're dealing with 350 different sites um, and 900 uh, individual buildings. And these are all part of my database. Um, so the, the Excel file, um, my friend sort of worked up the, this summer a uh, very basic sort of interface website um, that sort of plots them all out, uh, divides them by color into different periods and so forth. Now, this is just the list of sites, but you can divide it by prefecture or the time period and so forth. So this is the kind of data that um, is the basis for what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, oh, this is individual site uh, pages that have some pictures. I can't really actually put these pictures on um, doing maybe degree because I don't have copyrights for a lot of pictures, so um, this is all kind of temporary. Um, but then you can click and um, get more information about each specific building at the site. Um, so the first kind of topic today I want to talk about is how are archaeological sites discovered and preserved in Japan? And uh, when I look up or the, the sort of basic number of archaeological sites in Japan, um, they say <coughs> there's 46,000 archaeological sites in Japan. That's actually not um, a proper number at all. Um, there's 46,000 sites that have been excavated and have some kind of publication um, surrounding them. Um, my second point here is there's many, many, many multiple times more sites that are known. Um, and what happens is that we'll have um, plots of land that will be farmed, perhaps, and artifacts will come out of that. And these will be announced to the local boards of education, and they'll plot these all out on different kinds of maps. Um, 
this is just a random map of different archaeological sites at literally I don't know where this is from, a random um, sort of city. Um, but you can see that um, the Japan is very dense in terms of the number of archaeological sites. Uh, so when are sites excavated? Um, so they might be known, but in fact sites won't be excavated until there's some sort of development activity at the site. Um, so if it's um, flattening the land for farms, that's when they'll do excavation. If they're building a road, uh, that's when they'll do excavation. Um, and so these excavations will often be, they'll start with surveys. If they find things, they'll do um, more sort of detailed salvage e excavations. Um, in principle, these are all managed by boards of education. Um, however, the work may be done by MPOs or for-profit companies. Um, this map won't, or this graph won't make much sense, um, but starting in the 1970s up to the 1990s and today, what we see is here is a change in the amount of funding. This is 1.7 billion US dollars equivalent um, in 1997. And so you can see in sort of a period of 30 years, the amount of archaeological work and the amount of money spent on archaeology <laughs> grew dramatically. Japan had a sort of end of the bubble economy and it's gone down in terms of the amount of money expended. Um, although, interesting enough, this is the number of um, sort of permits for construction where they have to do some sort of survey work. And you see that that actually, this is where the peak in terms of funding was, but the actual numbers of archaeological sort of surveys has gone up quite a bit. Um, in fact, this is actually not the number of surveys. This would be about 30 something thousand. I can't actually see the number here. About 30 something thousand. But in terms of full scale excavations, we're dealing with about 9,000. And in terms of academic kinds of um, excavations, we're dealing with about 350 in any particular year. Um, so how are sites preserved in Japan? So in principle, uh, if a site will be destroyed by development, 100% will be excavated. Um, any unearthed remains will be completely removed um, for off-site storage. Um, larger sites or more significant sites will have these kind of on-site um, tours, um, usually at the end of the excavation system to sort of show off sort of the new um, discoveries. And if lucky, these will lead to public support for site preservation. And if there's enough people who are interested, uh, this will go to um, the sort of local city councils and so forth that will decide to preserve it. Um, and this may lead to other kinds of designations as well, which I want to talk about here. Um, so the designation maybe is what is really key for site preservation in Japan. Um, this historic site, uh, you'll see these signs at sites, and it says very specifically this is a uh, designated historic site. These designations are divided into sort of city, town, village level, prefectural level, national level, and then there's this kind of special national designation. Um, total in Japan, there's uh, around 800 or 1,800 national and 62 special national historic sites, but only really a small portion of these are archaeological in nature. So how are sites developed? Um, in general, there's, I think, four different types of pattern patterns for site development in Japan. Um, we'll have sites that are preserved with no obvious developments. Um, what we will have is vertical displacement. So a layer of ground will be put on top of the site itself. But with this one here, Basically, the field has remained an agricultural field, although there is a marker to note where it is. Um, another kind of development will be like this, where the site, again, the vertical displacement, um, turned into a grassy field or a park uh, that might have some monumental stones. That's actually not a, uh, anything original. It's just a kind of um, site sort of descriptor. Um, this is uh, a kind of reconstructed feature, but not anything really above ground. You'll have these sites that are developed with one or several 
buildings. Um, and you'll also have these kind of, I, I didn't, get, didn't have a good picture to show, but this is the sort of site map, reconstructed forests, reconstructed building. This is a shell maiden, which is sort of um, remaining there, and a museum. So it'll be a whole complex uh, archaeological research center attached to the site. Um, so I find these buildings interesting. Why I, I'm interested in these buildings is because they actually have a number of different messages about the past. Um, they communicate very specifically about prehistoric life ways. But as sort of research subjects for myself, I'm really interested in also the kind of meta-messages, the ideas that they communicate about the present and the past. Um, so this one here is not trying at all to be authentic in terms of the materials or the construction. This is made out of concrete. Um, but inside, we have sort of um, a accumulation of knowledge about the past being brought out into this um, diorama. Um, although we see very clearly that there's a very sort of contemporary model of the Japanese family, the two kids and the two parents, <laughs> that gets reproduced in this kind of thing. And so th there's very different kinds of messages and meta-messages that these produce. Um, ideas about sort of development, right? Oh, in the past we had these sort of hovels. Um, ideas about a golden age of the past. This is called the Jomong civilization. Um, ideas about sort of uniqueness or sort of special um, eras of Japanese history and so forth. And, and there's a lot of things that can be communicated with these as a whole. So the last thing I want to talk about here are kind of different models for reconstructions in Japan and in uh, the UK. Um, so the first model, I have th three in Japan. The first model is a place called Okyozuka Site. Um, and this is a kind of very typical classical sort of um, bureaucratic um, excavation and um, conservation model. Um, so Okyozuka Site is near Kanazawa, where I live. Um, and it's been developed in this particular way. It was excavated first in 1955. It was designated as a site in 1977 and developed in 1982. And we have reconstructed features, reconstructed buildings. We have, right across from that, a uh, museum that houses all the materials found there, um, as well as research center for everything in the entire town. Um, we have a, an attached sports ground right next to it, which is on top of the site itself. Um, and this is a sort of overview of the entire place. Um, now this, is, this one is interesting because actually, um, usually these will be placed directly on top of the features that they're meant to represent. Um, this one, they built a road through the middle of it. That's why they excavated it in the first place. And so this is actually a mirror of what they sort of destroyed there. So they're just sort of not only vertical, but a sort of horizontal displacement at it. Um, the second model is this place called the Uminoki site. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, but it's a very recent one, uh, 2003 excavated, designated 2014, and it's being developed today. Um, I went there just a couple weeks ago uh, with Yoshida-san over there, um, got the tour. Um, they're in the midst of building one here, there's a kind of empty uh, pit hole here that they're waiting for uh, people to sort of build. And what they're trying to really encourage here is a community-centered development. And I me and Yoshida san have been invited to sort of get our students together and help build one here. Um, this is just an example of the person who's currently building. He uses sort of Stone Age tools to cut down the trees and do some of the rebuilding. Um, I won't talk about that right now. Um, the last model is Goshino. I have a couple minutes, maybe one or two minutes. Um, this is uh, the only real experimental um, kind of site development in Japan. Um, here was very unique because they found uh, burnt remains that showed that the buildings actually had sod roofs rather than thatch roofs. And this was actually monumental in re reconstructing the image of these prehistoric homes in Japan. This was the model. This was the experimental building in 1997. They kind of left it for here for a couple of years and they burnt it down. Um, this remains today, this was 2013, 
um, and it remains more or less as it was when it was burnt, and they will leave it here for probably another 20 years or so before they excavate it to see how well it matched the original materials. But Goshino is unique in that they have gone through now two times of re rebuilding these, and each time they actually do um, measurements and surveys and so forth to record the process of decay and develop new models for doing this. Um, I don't have time to talk about these, but I have two examples in the UK that I've done a little bit of work. Um, one is the West Stowe village. Um, in terms of differences, we have um, this kind of difference, of course, <coughs> is the um, sort of um, experimental agricultural kind of activities, um, farm animals, um, and also what we see are these kind of mini digs that exist here that you generally don't see in Japan. Flag Fen is interesting. When I went there, there's this one here, which um, just had a tarp on top of it, and this other one here, which was in the middle of being rebuilt by uh, this man and his family from uh, Black Knight Historical, I think is the name of his uh, sort of company. And this is another kind of um, model for reconstruction that in Japan they don't have, this sort of idea of bringing in the sort of reenactments and the building as well. So that's really the kind of things that I wanted to talk about for today. Um, thank you very much.